Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to Grace Live. Would you help me welcome all of our first-time guests? We're so glad to have you with us, both here in the room as well as those of you online. Man, it's so good to see smiling faces. Nothing better than when I look out and you guys look like you're actually having a pretty good day. You know, sometimes I stand up here and you look like, don't talk to me. You know, obviously, it's good, it's good, I'm ready to do this. Hey, before we get into the message, though, I want to highlight the importance of Ignite Weekend. You just heard about Ignite Weekend coming up for our youth, and registration is open. You can register in the lobby or online, but I want to make sure we all understand why this is so important. You know, I remind you of something every now and then here that I don't get a lot of amens when I remind you of it, but here's the truth. We're all going to die. One amen. There we go. You know, we're supposed to be going to heaven and see Jesus. We should think that's good. Anyway, back to the real point, though. We are going to die, and the kingdom of God is going to be left in the hands of the next generation. And this is important because it it actually happened to the people in the Old Testament, God's people. It said there arose a generation who didn't know of God or the things of God. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen to our children here at Grace Life. So, you know, obviously, those of you that are coming out on Wednesday night to youth, you already know about this. That's where a lot of folks have heard and they've already registered. Maybe some of you haven't come out Wednesday night yet and you're saying, well, I guess that's just for them. Nope, it is for anybody, middle school, high school. It'd be a great time for you to, to see if you want to be a part of something here at youth. And you can just come to Ignite Weekend, even if you haven't done anything else. Maybe you've got a next door neighbor or somebody, whatever the story is, invite them. Bring them out because what we want to do is really put a foundation in our children uh, that they don't leave the faith when they leave the home. There we go. Now that's worthy of an amen. Well, with that being said, if you are a guest here today, we're in a series called Closer. Maybe if you've just been traveling and you're not a guest, you've missed a week or, or a part of it. The good news is everything so far is online or on our app, but today is actually part four. And this series has a very, very simple premise. How can we get closer to Jesus, because I I don't know anybody here who would say, I don't want to be closer to Jesus. We all would want to be closer to Jesus. And so what we've been doing is looking at different aspects of how we can do that. So we started the whole series with the idea of when Jesus said, follow me. You know, for 2,000 years and still today, he's calling people to follow him. And, And so we had to stop and just answer the question, what does it really mean to follow Jesus? We found a challenging answer, by the way. You might want to go back and hear that one if you missed it. Because once we know what it really means to follow Jesus, it's easy to answer the question, can I personally be following him more closely than I do? And then in the second part, we looked at the idea of seek me. You know, the greatest sermon ever given, of course, Jesus gave. And uh, we ended up with one of the most famous Bible verses we quote that came out of that sermon. It's seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Here's the reason we need the kingdom of God to come into our lives and into our world is because where you find the kingdom, you'll find the king. If you want to get closer to the king, get your life looking like the kingdom of God. And then we looked at part three, the idea of trust me. This is a challenging truth, but here's the the reality. You'll never be close to someone, God included, if you don't trust them when it matters most right? And so we talked about what does it mean to trust God? Well, two things in particular that are both difficult. The first one is to trust his decisions. That means he may not do what we want the way we want when we want. We have to trust his decisions and we have to trust he will do what he says. But that was last week. So today for part four, we're going to look at the idea of worship me. How can we get closer to Jesus through the idea of worship me? Some of you know that I actually used to be a worship pastor. That means before I would preach, I would actually sing. And before somebody else would preach, I used to lead the singing time and the music time. And, uh, you know, that's because I have a passion in me to make sure that everybody does anything they can to bring glory to God, just to glorify God with their lives. That's just, like, that's one of my deepest passions. And so sometimes people will ask me, if that's like one of your core passions, then why did you stop being a worship pastor? And my first answer is always very, very simple, because you don't have to preach in tune. I'm glad y'all got that one. You see, I play piano. That's the skill God gave me. Uh, singing, not so much. And so, uh, but piano, I can always play in tune because you hire someone to tune it. It's very, very simple, right? Uh, singing's a little more challenging for me. But the real answer is actually, I've never stopped being a worship pastor. 
See, as we talk about worshiping Jesus today, it's really important for you to know that although we worship through singing in church sometimes, and maybe you worship through singing in your car, worship is so much more than singing songs. And worship is so much more than a church service. This is a worship service. That's what we call it. Yeah, but because there's so much more to what we do. It's every part of our lives. And so what I really want to do, and I get to do it now through preaching, regardless of whether or not I'm in tune, is I get to help people glorify God with every single part of our lives. So the question I'd ask you today, has he ever actually thought about that? Have you ever thought about what it means to worship with every single thing you do in life? Every single thing that you do, all of the time, like everything is worship. Matter of fact, for this message, I decided I would make it really simple by just looking up the definition of worship. Here's what worship is. It is to honor or show adoration to something or someone. It doesn't even have to be the God of the Bible because it actually doesn't even have to be a God according to the definition. It is whatever you give what you have to honor or to adore someone or something. What that means is everything that we give our time, our talent, or our treasure to honor and adore, that's what we're worshiping at every single moment in life. I've got a friend of mine that's from Texas, and he likes to brag. And by the way, y'all know everything's bigger in Texas, right? Anybody ever been to Texas, right? He likes to brag to me all the time, well, Jimmy, you know, some of the biggest churches in the world are in Texas. And the first time he, he told me that, I, was, I, I kind of went along with it. Like, yeah, you're, you're right. You know, T.D. Jakes, you know, Dr. Tony Evans, Robert Morris. I mean, I started going through the list of the most famous preachers in America, and they're all in Texas. And he said, no, 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 Jimmy, that's not what I'm talking about. The Dallas Cowboys Stadium, the Texas Longhorn Stadium. And before you guys judge all of the Texas people, you know, we've got some pretty big houses of worship here in South Carolina too. Death Valley, williams Bryce Stadium. Come on, right? Y'all did, yeah, look, some of y'all got Gamecock shirts on and y'all frowned when I said that. But think about it. I mean, that really is a pretty big act of worship because first of all, tens of thousands of us, tens of thousands, all gather in one place at one time. You don't even mind that you have to pay to park your car. You know, parking at church is free for the record. But you don't even mind you have to pay to park your car miles away. You'd think if you had to pay to park your car that it would at least come with valet parking or something. You know, and you don't get that. On top of that, all of the grown men actually show up in matching clothes. I mean, come on, that's got to be an act of worship to get grown men to wear matching clothes. And think about how much of your time and your talent and your treasure. It's an all-day affair because nobody can worship appropriately without a good tailgate beforehand, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? And how much money do we spend and how much of our effort? And it's all so that we can pray they will do something that very often they don't do. But that depends on your team. That's, you know, y'all aren't getting excited about it yet. It's not even football season and I made y'all mad. All right, before I get in any more trouble, let's go back to a topic you actually enjoy a little bit more than picking on your uh, football team. Let's go back to talking about dying. Again, you're going to die someday. And when you do, that means that someone is going to have to clean out your house and close out your finances. Some of y'all should... Help them out and get a little head start for them, you know. Matter of fact, I think some of y'all are doing just the opposite. You walk out to your garage and you look at that mess and go, yep, that'll be my kid's problem someday. And you go right back inside. So you're like, I am not helping. Nope, I'm just going to leave it all there. Okay, back to the point. Someday someone is going to have to clean out your house and close out your finances and they're going to evaluate your life. What are they going to say you worship? What are they going to say that all your time and your talent and your treasure went to? So with that in mind, our idea today for trying to get closer to Jesus through worship is, is a very simple reality. We worship whatever we get close to. And whatever we get close to, we will worship more. Did y'all follow that? That is actually true. We worship what we get close to and whatever we get close to, we will worship more. If you've got your Bibles, you can follow along. We're going to be in John chapter 9 at the very beginning of the, the chapter today. But everybody else, don't worry. It will be on the screen. And I just want to show you what I think is one of the best illustrations of the response to meeting Jesus. And so we're looking at a man who was blind and begging, and Jesus walks by him. So here we go. Verse 1, chapter 9. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? 
this man or his parents that he was born blind. But Jesus answered him, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. You know, a lot of people think this is not a very important part of the story, and it's, it's not a main detail. It's going to give us a few clues as we go throughout the story. But I want to stop and talk about it because I think a lot of us miss the importance of a seed that has been planted in our minds for thousands of years. And we see it in the people of God then that we believe even today. And it is the idea that if we get anything good, it is based upon what we deserve because we've done well. And if we get anything bad in our circumstances, it's because we've done something bad. You get what you deserve and you deserve what you get. You guys know what I'm talking about. Now, I, I, the problem with this is that it actually has a name. Now, it didn't have a name 2,000 years ago, even though they believed it, but today it has a name, and it's a part of several false religions. It's called karma. It is the idea that the universe is handing out good circumstances if you are a good boy or a girl, and bad circumstances if you are bad. Now, I'm not talking about sowing and reaping and like if you steal, you might go to jail. I'm not talking about just natural consequences. I'm talking about an idea that says we earn everything good and we deserve everything bad because it is the exact opposite of our God and the gospel. Did you know that? You see, our God did the best thing for us when we were at our worst. Did you know the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us? While we were still sinners, God shows his love for us in this, that Christ died for us. When we had done the worst to God, when we had offended him the most, when we had gone as far from him as we could get, when we were doing everything as ungodly as we could, when we were in a place to deserve nothing, our God took a step toward us in love. He poured out mercy, he poured out grace, and he saved us. It is the exact opposite of the idea of karma. And the reason that I want to take a, a moment to just talk about that is because so often we don't realize that even in our Christian walk, we've allowed false religions to sneak in, and we are actually praying based on another religion. And follow me. Some of you are saying, Jimmy, I don't, I don't follow you. I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. How many times do you pray and you tell God the things that you've done well? the things you've done right, and why God should answer your prayer? Or how many times do you simply pray believing God's going to answer it because you were good last week? How many times do you not pray because you did something really bad last night and you want to stay away from God because you know you deserve bad and you don't want to get it, right? You guys with me? We don't realize it, but we've actually turned the God of the Bible into a karma God half the time. So I just think it's important we take any moment we can to, to get an accurate view of who God is. And so with that being said, let's keep going. Verse 6 in our story. Jesus, having said these things, spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. Anybody weirded out by all this? I mean, it's, it's one of the stranger stories in all of the Bible, I'm going to admit. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And the man went and washed. And he came back seeing. And I don't know about you, but I'm giving the man a whole lot of credit for the way he responded here because I don't think I would have done that. I mean, if, if a stranger walks up to me, spits in the mud and rubs it on my face and now says, go wash it off, I'm going to be like, you put it there, fool. You wash it off. Like, yeah, but what do you do? You do? I'm like, this makes no sense. It's one of the weirdest stories. And people love when we preach on it because they're always like, man, I can't wait for the pastor who did research this week to finally explain to me why did Jesus do that? So did a lot of research and 2,000 years worth of commentaries and scholars, they all absolutely agree. We have no idea. We have no idea. One scholar did suggest that God was simply echoing creation because he made mankind out of dirt and dust. And it was like Jesus saying, by the way, I was there in creation. I was a part of it. Check it out. We still do it. My personal answer, now I'm not a scholar, but my personal answer is, I think God likes to keep us guessing. I think, he, you know, how many times do we say, God, if you don't answer this prayer, my life is going to fall apart. How many times do you know you should never pray like that? Because God's like, oh, is that a challenge to do it another way? I think that's all God's up to right here. Let me just show you something. But listen, don't miss something that really matters to you and me today. That didn't make any more sense 2,000 years ago than it does today. Spit in the dirt, rub it on his eyes, and go. I mean, the dude's blind. 
He didn't even say, like, here's some wipes, wipe it off. But you're blind, fill your way all the way down the walls to the pool of Siloam and wash it off. Like, he didn't make anything easy. Nothing made any sense at all. Didn't make any sense then. Didn't make any sense, doesn't make any sense today. But don't miss this. The man still trusted and did it. And if he didn't do something, even though it made absolutely no sense, that man would have died a blind man. He says he went and did it. Didn't know why, but he went and did it and he came back seeing. And you and I today, that's why part three was about trust me. You and I today are still going to have to take a step that makes no sense sometimes if we want to get closer to Jesus, if we want to come back seeing or some other thing that we're asking God to do in our lives. But let's keep going because we've got a whole lot more we're going to learn from this guy today. So now he can see, right? Verse 8, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some said, yep, yep, it sure is, that's him. And others said, no, no, nope, it's his doppelganger. Sure, looks a whole lot like him, but I mean, how can a blind man see? But he kept saying, it is me, it is me. I am the man. That means a little something different today, doesn't it? You know, but I mean, I am the man. And so they said to him, well, then how are your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus. Well, he made mud, he anointed my eyes. He said, go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and I washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, well, where is he? I don't know. And so they grabbed the man and they took him to the Pharisees who had been formerly blind. Okay, so here's the deal. The Pharisees at this point had basically become like the religious police. There was a time where they wanted to be a group of followers who were sincerely close to God. And so they were one of the uh, groups of the Jews, except what had happened over the time is that as they wanted to get closer to God, they kept coming up with more and more rules you had to follow to get close to God. So now they become experts in rules. So they actually took the few things God said to do, like the Ten Commandments, and they came up with 613 rules on how to do those things. And so they had all of these, you can't do this and you got to do it that way and you got it, whatever. And so they have now brought this guy to them to investigate. I mean, think about that. You can see you've been blind for decades. Instead of saying, let us give you a tour of the flowers and the artwork. It's like, instead of a celebration, you get an inquisition. We're going to take you to the religious police who are going to ask you questions and doubt everything that's happened in your life. I don't even believe this is God. I don't believe God is doing this. And you know what? This also hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Because all the time as a pastor, I see people so excited. They meet Jesus, they make him their king, they get saved, they can't wait to tell their family what has happened. And their family is the closest one to them, the first ones to shake their head and say, Psh, I, don't, I don't think God's really moving in your life. I, I just think you're making all this up. You're just trying to give us another song and another dance. Listen, just like this man in the story, sometimes... You're going to have to stand strong on what you know Jesus did and not worry about the doubters and the haters. Sometimes you're going to have people that they don't see it just yet. You're going to have to give them time, so don't be discouraged. So let's keep going and find out what the big deal was. The big deal is very simple in one sentence. Now it was a Sabbath day. It was the Sabbath when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. Of all of the things that the Pharisees were the most policy about was the Sabbath. They thought that when God said you can't work on the Sabbath, that they had to come up with a whole set of rules on exactly what you could do and what you couldn't do and how you could follow all these different things. And, and more than anything else, they wanted to guard and make sure everybody was following the Sabbath. Now, look, a lot of modern-day Christians misunderstand how Jesus treated the Sabbath. And they think that we don't have to honor God the Sabbath anymore. Uh, there, there's a whole other sermon I need to do on this because you need to understand our souls were not meant to carry the kind of stress and weight we do 24-7. That's why we're supposed to take a day and lay that weight down and worship God and receive. Our bodies are not made to work the way that many of us do 24-7, and we're supposed to take time and lay that down and, and enjoy God. But because Jesus said, don't you know the Sabbath was made for, for man, we think, oh, that means I can just slave away. Actually, what you need to understand is Jesus always honored the Father's heart about the Sabbath. He just didn't follow the Pharisees' rules about the Sabbath. See, the Pharisees were the ones who said, you can't heal on the Sabbath. Healing is work. And maybe if you got to stand on your foot, feet with a scalpel and do like a 17-hour surgery, if we got any doctors in the room, maybe that's work. But for Jesus, he's like making mud pies here. So he's having fun, you know? I mean, it's not exactly work. He's enjoying himself, and now a guy can see. 
But what happens is they're all offended because if Jesus doesn't have to follow their rules on the Sabbath and people start following him, then they will lose their influence, they'll lose their control, they'll lose their positions, they'll lose their money. They can't have this Jesus guy doing this. So they're upset. So that's why they're asking these questions. That's where they're challenging him. So the Pharisees, in verse 15, again asked him how he received his sight. And he said to them the same thing he said before. He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Seriously, guys, how many times do I need to tell you? Some of the Pharisees said, this man, speaking of Jesus, is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But now some of them are finally starting to catch on, and others said, but how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? After all, it's your eyes he opened. What do you say? And his answer was inaccurate. He said he's a prophet. Interesting answer. First of all, let me explain why he answered that, and then I'm going to tell you what's most important for you and me to get there. He didn't really know Jesus yet. He was a blind man. He's sitting either on a walkway or on a street or something, and, and all he hears is this crowd coming and this, this murmur, and you can, you can know if you're blind something big is happening because of all the noise and all the people you hear coming down the street because at this point Jesus is famous and, and crowds follow him, and you can just hear, it's Jesus coming, Jesus coming, here. everybody's talking. So he hears the name Jesus, he hears the crowd, suddenly the crowd comes to a complete hush because Jesus stops walking, reaches down, Spits in the sand, makes some mud, rubs it on his eyes, tells him to go and be healed. He does that. When he opens his eyes, there's no Jesus. He didn't really get to see him or to experience him or to know anything about him or to ask any other question. All he knows is somebody else was talking and whispering and eventually he got something muddy on his face. So all he can figure is whoever this guy is, everybody's talking about, everybody's following, he must be like one of our other great prophets, like Elijah. Elijah did miracles. Elisha did miracles. I mean, he's got to be like one of them. It's all that he understands at this point. So we're going to skip part of the story right here because it's going to make more sense to us next week. And it's got a really beautiful part for where we're going to go in the series but what happens that we're going to skip for today is they didn't like his answers, so they went and got his parents. Turns out they're not going to like their answers either, so they come back and challenge him again. This is the second time. Everybody jump to verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. I think that's hilarious. We don't know him, we've never met him, but we don't like him, so he's got to be wrong. Agree with us. And you know, that is also something that hasn't changed. In 2,000 years, how many times is there a controversy in our world and somebody who clearly does not follow Jesus begins to tell the rest of us what Jesus would or would not do or think? How many times is there a controversy in somebody who doesn't even like God or follow God or claim to be a person who loves God begins to tell everybody else in the world like who God is or what God would say or do? Look, I, I want to say this, especially to young people, because there are so many opinions in, in the world on social media. It, it is so important. Do not let someone who does not follow Jesus define Jesus for you. Did y'all get that? Do not let someone who does not follow Jesus define Jesus for you. There is only one place that you can accurately find a picture of Jesus and God's opinion, and it's not on social media. I'm going to move on before I make somebody mad, but I did not name any names, so I'm just going to, that's all there is to that right there. And so the man answered, look, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, only one thing, but one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. And this is what is so important for you and me to get as you think about, I want to invite my neighbor to church or I want to talk to a coworker, but I'm afraid of the questions they may ask me or the things they may want to know. Look, here's the deal. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to go to Bible college because if you've met Jesus, you are the authority of your story. This man's like, he's real simple. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Let me tell you what I know. I met him, I was blind, now I see. You become the authority on your story. 
Even when people are doubting your life, all you've got to do is stay true to what Jesus has done and just keep repeating it. He's told them three times, like, all I did, the man named Jesus, he spit, he made mud, he put it on my eyes, I went and washed it. Seriously, how many more times do you want to hear? I was blind, now I see. They start asking more questions. I don't know. Matter of fact, this is important for us. Do you have questions about God? Anybody in here have questions about the Bible? I've got questions. That was not a trick. You can actually raise your hand. I have questions about the Bible. I have questions I can't wait to get to heaven to ask God. And I like, I study the Bible for a living. I talk about the Bible and I've got questions. And here's why this is so important. Because if we're going to get closer to Jesus, we need to make sure that we don't let our questions keep us from Jesus. But what we actually know, let that draw us closer. Y'all see that? I can't tell you the number of times I've tried to have a conversation with somebody. Did you know that God loves you? And their response is like, yes. Can you tell me what you believe about the six days of creation? I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you know Jesus forgives you? He died on the cross for you. Well, yes, but are you transubstantiation or consubstantiation? Man, I had to even think to get those words out of my mouth. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what? Are we? That has something to do with communion. That's all y'all don't need to know. That's my point. People are hung up on questions instead of building on answers. We've all got questions. Don't let the questions keep you from getting closer to Jesus. We're going to be answering questions every day that we follow him, and then we'll get the rest of them when we get to heaven. Right now, stand on what you know. And that's who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And so the man answers them, look, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's the best I can tell you. I was blind, now I see, and if he's not from God, how can he do this? So they answered him, as true to the karma God they believed at the beginning. Since you're blind, you were born in utter sin. Who are you to teach us, you sinner? And they cast him out. But that's not where the story ends. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said, Well, you've seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Look at the man's first response. Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. He worshiped him. See, here's the truth. If we get close to Jesus, the immediate first response is to worship him. It's what's going to happen in your life. If you get close to Jesus, you're going to worship him, and check this out. If you take that step and worship him, he's going to draw you closer to him. If you meet Jesus, you're going to worship him. As you worship him, it's going to draw you closer to him. It becomes a cycle in your life. It energizes itself, and you get closer and closer to Jesus every day because if you've met him, you'll worship him. If you worship him, you'll get closer to him. What every one of us today simply needs to do is to answer, ask and answer, how can I get that cycle operating in my life? How can I get to where I take a step towards Jesus and begin to experience him that he draws me closer and closer and closer? And that really is the only thing we're going to talk about today is to answer how can we get that operating in our lives, this idea of worship. But before we look at this idea of where we are on the journey of worship, I want to make sure everybody understands we're not talking about singing songs in here. That is part of it. That's part of it. But, but worship is everything we do. Worship is every word we speak. Worship is the tone with which you speak every word. Worship is what you think, even when you think no one knows what you're thinking. Worship is when you forgive, even though you're very angry. Worship is when you treat people the way God says, even though you don't think they deserve it. Worship is also how you declare God to be good outside of a church building as well as inside of a church building. Yes, it is worship to sing songs. Yes, it may be worship to even raise your hands. But there is more to worship than singing songs in this room. Are you guys with me on that one? Because what we really want to talk about today is just answering the simplest question. Where am I? Where are you on the journey of worshiping Jesus? That's it. Because if we can identify where we are, then we'll know how to take that next step to get closer to him. Now, I want you to notice that the question is very specific. Where am I on the journey of worshiping Jesus? Not just on the journey of worship. Let me tell you where you are on the journey of worship. You are absolutely killing it. You are knocking it out of the park. You are amazing, every single one of us. You know why? Because we all worship. We all worship. Every single one of us, every day, you get up and you use all 24 of your hours 
We all spend all of our money. We give all of our energy to honor something. We are creatures of worship. It is who we are and what we do. The only question we actually have to ask is who or what are we worshiping? We are creatures of worship. So today we want to talk about worshiping Jesus. And so the journey of worshiping Jesus begins with this one. The first step is to be able to say, I am grateful that he saved me. I'm grateful that he saved me. Some of you are not there. Most are here because we're in a church service on a Sunday morning. So most people statistically in a church service on a Sunday morning are here because you would say I have a relationship with Jesus. And at least I'd like to believe that about our church. I, I, I would, and if I'm wrong, well, then we're going to do something about that here in a minute. But I would like to believe that many of you know Jesus as your king. You'd say, I've taken that first step. There are a few people here who you've maybe met or been briefly touched by Jesus, like the man who had been healed but didn't even know that he wasn't a prophet and had never really gotten a good look at him. There are some of us here who we, we've met him, but we really haven't come to a place of realizing we needed him to save us. Matter of fact, that's really the key issue. Do you believe you have a need? See, the man knew he had a need. If anybody asked him, I'm blind. I've got a problem that I can't solve for myself. You know, we've got a very famous song. It's been around churches forever called Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. That's the opening line. How many of y'all like to say, what a wretch I was? Truth is, it offends a lot of people. Well, here's the problem. If that offends you and you don't think you have a need, it's going to be pretty hard to worship Jesus for meeting that need and saving you. So it begins, the journey of worshiping Jesus begins with recognizing you have a need. And for maybe you today, it is that you're not perfectly holy, but our God is. And so we've been separated by him. It's what we call sin. Every single one of us at some point has had a thought, an action, said words. We've done something that's not perfectly holy. And we need to be saved from paying for our sins. That's what that word is. If you're, if you're new to church, you're like, why do they always talk about being saved? It's being saved from paying for our sins because our sins have to be paid for with blood. According to God, that means that somebody has to die. But Jesus chose to take that place for you and me. Before we leave, I'm going to talk to those of you that have not begun the journey and give you a chance to begin that. But again, let's get back to where I think many of you would say, I am today, Jimmy. I am grateful I'm saved. Is there anybody that's willing to, to be bold about it? Say, I am grateful today that I am saved by Jesus. Now, here's the problem that comes next. What I just asked is a common answer. But many people can't say they're in the next place of worshiping Jesus, and that is to say, I'm changed by him. I'll talk to Christians sometimes and say, hey, tell me your Jesus story. Well, man, I'll tell you what, I was going to church, you know, I think it was like 12 years ago, or when I was a kid, and somebody was preaching, I gave my life to Jesus, and man, I know I'm forgiven, and it's amazing, and I'm going to spend my life in heaven, eternity in heaven. Oh, it's, I, I'm so excited about that. Oh, that's awesome, that's awesome. What about last year? What about three years ago? Well, you know, I'm, I'm forgiven and going to heaven. Some of us, we worship Jesus as our Savior, but we don't take the next step to let him change us, to worship him as Lord. You know, Jesus actually challenged his followers. Why do you call me Lord? But you don't do what I say. Jesus said a whole lot of things that challenge us to not just get there at the beginning and stop. And for some of us, our journey of worshiping Jesus I'm going to heaven, woo! And we stopped. We never took another step of saying, well, Jesus, I'm so glad I'm going to heaven, but you know, I've also got this habit. I've got this addiction. I don't treat my spouse well. I, my kids don't even want to talk to me. I do kind of yell at them. I'm kind of mean. I mean, I punch walls or people or, you know, whatever the story is. I show a lot of people only one of my fingers when I drive. Jesus, help me. I mean, come on, y'all know what I'm saying. Do you have a need? Jesus needs to change us. It leads to the third part of this, and that is I give him unabandoned worship. We're only going to look at those three phases. I think wherever you are comes down to meeting him, being saved, 
allowing him to change you day after day after day. And at some point, you cross a line. You cross a line. If you could see the stage, there are two different boards. There's a line right here. And you, you simply step across the line. You see, unabandoned worship is about giving God what he deserves regardless of who's watching. Unabandoned worship is about what he deserves, not our reputation. Many of us don't take this step on the journey because we're concerned about our reputation and what people are saying and thinking about us. Let me remind you, I'm not just talking about a church service. That does matter in a church service for some of you you find this very difficult to do in worship in a church service. The Bible says lift holy hands. You know, this is a sign of exaltation. That's what that means. If you wonder, why do they do that in church? It's because it's a sign of exaltation. And you might want a pastor to explain that to you, but you don't need to. Because what happens when your team scores a touchdown? Your hands automatically go. No, your hands automatically go. Woo! So some of us, we do need to cross the line of some unabandoned worship. The Bible says kneel. I know it gets a little crowded in this service. It might be a little tough on the kneeling part, but, but raising hands and, and shouting and, and singing and, and kneeling. And some of us do need to actually display our love for God in a church service. But please don't get hung up on that because we also need to give unabandoned worship outside of this building. What that means is that work when somebody is given a crude joke and making fun of Christians, you say, I'm sorry, but I am a Christian and that's not funny. Or when somebody is talking about your God and, and it's not kind, then you say, that's my God. Would you like to have a more accurate picture of him? When, when you actually claim Jesus outside of a church service, you do realize it's very easy to do that in here. Everybody in here is going to kind of agree with you. It's okay to go, hey, I love Jesus in here. I mean, nobody's going to hit you. But to give unabandoned worship to him out there, that's a little tougher to do, isn't it? So that's where we are. I'm going to leave you with a challenge today. And that is, it, it, this is so simple. Ask God, what one thing can you do to move forward on your journey of worshiping Jesus? Just one thing. Just one. For some of you, it is to, to say, Jesus, I need you to save me. For some of us, it's to say, Jesus, thank you for saving me so long ago. I need you to change me. For some of us, it's to say, Jesus, I need to actually stand for you no matter what my classmates think of me, what my coworkers think of me. I, I want to give you unabandoned worship 24-7. When I'm driving, when I'm in church, when I'm at school, when I'm at work, I want to give you unabandoned worship. Let God answer the question for you. What is the one thing I can do? What is my next step in the journey of worshiping Jesus? Because here's the truth. If we worship him, we will only continue to get closer to him. If we get close, we'll worship. If we worship, we'll only get closer. It's a cycle. Every one of us needs it in our lives. And there's one step we can all take. Whatever God just spoke to you, let me pray for us. God, we thank you so much that you did reach out to us based on your goodness and not ours, that you've loved us, you've poured out your grace, you've poured out your mercy, that you have reached every single one of us with so much love. God, today we, we want to say we worship you. We choose to worship you and we would ask you to help us at times where we're maybe more concerned about something else or distracted by the things of this world, would you help us to realize that we've broken our worship? Because God, we want to be people who sincerely worship you. So draw us closer. If you just stay in a place of prayer, I want to speak to those of you that have yet to make Jesus your king. As we said earlier, every one of us has been separated from God. We've all had a thought, said a word, or done something. It's not perfectly holy. But the good news is God loved you so much that he didn't leave you there. He sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life so that when he died, his bloodshed and his body broken could pay for your sins and mine. We call it the free gift of salvation. 
we are forgiven, our guilt and shame removed, and we're given eternal life being right with God. But as we also said today, some of us have never received that gift. And if you've never done that, I want to help you do that. Wherever you are, simply say something like this to yourself and to God. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. And so now I choose to live for you. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that I'm forgiven. My simple prayer here today, would you give me a life of great meaning in your kingdom? Amen. Would everybody help me celebrate with them? Amen.